Hey, good evening, everyone. It's Tracy coming to you live from New Hampshire Dog Walking Club headquarters. And I am here tonight with two attorneys, Megan Martucci and Brittany Stacy from Feniger and Ulias. Did I say that correctly? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Great. Oh, it's for me. <laughs> we are going to be talking to you guys tonight about estate planning for your pets. Uh, you may be aware that November is National Senior Pet Month. We've had lots of great education coming your way in regards to taking care of your senior pet. And I'm really excited about tonight's conversation because I think it's one of those conversations that is overlooked. Um, one of those things in the planning of your life and your pet's life uh, that is very much overlooked. I know that Megan and Brittany are going to be uh, sharing some really great information with us tonight that you may not necessarily think of when you are planning your will and planning what's going to happen to your pets if you pass before they do. So I'm going to let Megan and Brittany introduce themselves here once we get started. But two key things um, I want to let you know first uh, before I give you all the good stuff that we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, first off, if you are a member of our community and you ask a question on the live broadcast, you do earn an entry into our giveaways for the month. And then also, Megan and Brittany are giving away a $25 gift certificate to Hopknot, which is a craft brewery in Manchester. And we will actually award that at the end of the presentation. So stay with us live to see if you have won that. And in order to earn an entry into that, you need to ask a question during the live broadcast as well. So... Exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight is we're going to give you an understanding of the basics of estate planning. You're going to get a brief overview of the probate process and what that can mean for your pets, as well as an overview of estate planning methods to ensure the continued care of your pets. So I'm really excited about this. Thank you, Megan and Brittany, for joining us tonight. And can you guys tell us a little bit about your, what you do in your company? Sure. First off, thank you so much, Tracy, for having both of us here. Um, I'm an estate planning attorney with Feniger and Ulias, and Brittany is a business attorney, but she also does a little bit of the estate planning, too, for Massachusetts. Um, Brittany, do you have anything to add? No, I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, in the business sphere where I spend most of my time, there is significant overlap because business owners um, are also pet lovers and uh, need estate plans. So Megan and I work Closely together, I am licensed in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, but the both of us work primarily out of our Manchester office. Now, you guys both have dogs as well, right? Yes. I think you told me. So are they, do you have these pets already in your wills? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I have such. a whole trust with my dog included. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, you guys have all the firsthand information, so I figured, mm -hmm. okay. Well, all right, so where should we start? Should we jump right uh, into the presentation? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I'll flash that up on the screen here. I was going right. to say, lucky lucky for me, uh, my dog's such a cuddly mush that I don't think I'll have a problem um, have, finding somebody to take care of her. Or something <laughs> <more that good. laughs> yep. That's always the, the crucial part. Who's going to take over? Exactly. All right. So let's get started here. Sure. Um, so I'm going to get us started and not, you know, I'm going to start with the obvious of why are we talking about estate planning for pets? Most people think of estate planning um, for themselves or maybe their elderly family or something like that. But um, pets are, are included. So um, most people, uh, pets are part of their family. I know for myself, um, my dog is definitely part of my family. And so in, in a crisis event or if something were to happen, um, you know, I would want to make sure that there was care or something for my pet, whether it's a dog, a cat. Um, I particularly have a dog, so I'll probably reference a dog. But you just want to make sure that there's a plan in place for short-term care and also long-term care. Um, it's easy to get caught up in chaotic life events, and unfortunately, sometimes the pets could be forgotten. Um, so why we're talking about estate planning is so you can include your pets, and there's very um, a couple different ways to do that. Um, and, and there's a nice mechanism that Megan has has worked on to allow your pets to basically seamlessly be involved in your estate plan. Um, so in under state law, they are uh, considered property. So, you know, you want to take extra care in making sure that there is a plan in place for them. So that way they're just not treated like a piece of property because as this chart will show um they're they are part of most household families so over the last several years the increase in household pets um is is 
pretty drastic, as you can see on the chart that Megan has there. Um, some other statistics that really kind of hone in on why pets need to be part of the estate planning as well is because, you know, again, more statistics just showing that pet ownership is replacing things like having children or even if it's temporary or long term, um, households, families, and even just individuals in the United States are, are, you know, having more dogs or, um, you know, foregoing having children, whether it's for financial or other reasons. Um, but I know for myself, mid thirties, no kids. I have a dog. I treat my dog like family. She is my furry little dog. <laughs> so, um, anyways, those are the reasons why we consider pets to be family and why they should be ultimately included as part of your estate plan. Um, so Megan is going to talk to you about the, some of the key factors of the estate plan, why it's important, and then we'll ultimately get to how to include provisions for your pets to make sure they are taken care of. So thank you, Brittany. Um, jumping off of that, uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is what is estate planning? Because without a foundation of what that is, it doesn't really matter if we talk about how pets are included. So when it comes to estate planning, the goal is to protect your assets and your dignity um, through various mechanisms such as powers of attorney, wills, and trusts for both before you pass away and then when you do pass away. Some of the benefits of um, estate planning comes with um, protection of assets and making sure that those assets transfer to the ben beneficiaries you want, appointing guardians for any minor children, assisting any family members with making difficult decisions by giving them a clear outline of what your desires are, minimizing legal and probate costs down the road, and planning for any kind of incapacity, and then also making sure that those assets that you've accrued, if you have charities that you're particularly passionate about, making sure that those charities are taken care of through benefit. Um, sorry, donations and your passing and kind of any other extra protections you want to include, and especially for those pets that you want to make sure are taken care of in the way you would have wanted when you were alive. So what documents are included in an estate plan is typically living wills, powers of attorney for health care, powers of attorney for finance, wills, tr and trust. And trusts have several different categories, including pet trusts, which make sure, again, that you, those individuals are taken care of in the way you want. So going into just the generals of each of these types of documents for powers of attorney for healthcare, the goal is to make sure that healthcare decisions, um, you outline them and make sure that the agent can act on your behalf in situations of incapacity. For powers of attorney for finance, it's again, pointing an agent to make decisions financially for you if you either are unable to, or again, are in that incapacitated state. And then there's also powers of attorney for pets, where we outline who your pet's veterinarians are, who's the guardian of your pet, and allows that person to act to make sure that if you're incapacitated, that pet is being taken care of, and that all of those needs that your pet has are outlined for that agent. So for wills, oops, I think I bounced a little too far. Anyway, for wills and trusts, um, a will is an outline of what you want done by, that's then submitted to the probate court and initiates probate. And then a trust actually bypasses that probate process by moving all of your assets into the trust and allows a trustee to administer it. With a will, a, tr a pet can't be included as a beneficiary. So if you wanted to create a stipend to make sure for the continued care of your pet, that can't be included as part of your will. It will need to be put into a trust, um, which we'll discuss a little bit going down. So what happens to you and your pets if you don't have an estate plan in place. So without an estate plan, um, the court requires that you go through probate to access any of the assets so that it can be moved to your beneficiaries. And those distributions to your beneficiaries are based on New Hampshire statutes. Pets particularly are considered property, so they're going to go to whoever would be in your inheritance, or sorry, the individual who would inherit under New Hampshire statutes. Um, which may not necessarily be the person that you think would be best able to take care of that pet. Um, probate also can be very time consuming and very costly, which often leaves, especially pets in limbo. So if somebody doesn't know who's taking care of the pet, a lot of times they get put in shelters or they're just kind of given to somebody quickly who maybe doesn't know how to take care of your pet appropriately, um, which can create a lot of stress for your pet or can result in them moving around to different houses, which again, a lot of stress. So Megan, I have a question for you. Yeah, absolutely. So 
When you put your pets in your will, do you need to name them or can you just say pets in general? So usually what we do is pets in general. So this way we don't have to constantly update the documents. Um, like I said before, though, it's not usually addressed in a will because a pet is considered property and the purpose of a will is to address who is inheriting your assets. Um, so, but in a trust, we include a provision and we'll usually, sometimes I'll name the specific pets and they'll put in parentheses and any other pets that I may own in the future. So this way we do a catch all, or we don't have to constantly update if, you know, we create a, a trust with the expectation that your pet may outlive you, but if they don't, but you still get other pets, we don't have to constantly come back and update. So now I thought only dogs were considered property, cats and pocket pets and other types of animals. I didn't think were, maybe, maybe farm animals are, but aren't they all just a little bit different when they're considered in a will? So gen generally courts kind of approach it all together. It, it's not something, it's not an inheritable item um, or not an, something that could inherit. It's usually treated like when we say property, we mean that they are distributed to a person, um, but they're not given, for example, some people want to give some kind of benefit to the pet like a, a stipend to make sure for their ongoing care. A will doesn't allow for that kind of stipend because technically the pet's the owner of that money um, and that's not functional. So that can be done in a trust is what you're saying? Yes, okay. so, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit more. <laughs> okay, okay, great. And I have a few comments here too, if yep. we can flash them up from people watching. So Michelle says, I never even thought about this until we got a reactive dog and just recently redid our estate docs. I wanted to make sure he was going to have the opportunity to live a good life when we were gone and he wasn't put with someone who couldn't manage him and was euthanized. And I think Michelle brings up a really good point here because a lot of the members of our group rescue dogs mm -hmm. and a lot of rescue dogs are damaged and need, you know, special care in regards to reactive behavior. So they can't just go to anybody who wouldn't understand a reactive dog. So I would guess in a, in an instance like that, would you, tell people to recommend specific family members that might be able to handle? Yes, absolutely. That. That is, this is like the exact example where an estate plan is super crucial because without some kind of provision in place that outlines the specific person who would be able to handle a pet like that, um, it would just go to whoever would inherit it based on either what's outlined on a will or what's outlined in intestacy laws, which means a lot of people are inheriting animals that they can't take care of. And usually the result of that is that they wind up in shelters um, and unfortunately euthanized or some, something else like that. So that's our yeah, goal to avoid. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we've seen a lot of that, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, I don't know if you go into this in further detail, but I think we need to stress the fact that a conversation really ha needs to be had with these people that you're naming in your will and not just assuming that your parents or your kids or your sister or your brother is going to be willing to take these pets on. Right, absolutely. The conversation, yeah, happen before the documents are drafted, really, to make sure that they're on board with taking on the responsibility. Um, exactly. And if there's exactly. questions about whether there will be money put aside to take care of them, if they have, you know, whatever it is, if they have special needs that require additional funds, and you know, assuring the person that if you do this, there will whatever the case may be. Um, but definitely, that's a great point that you just brought up. Ha asking and really having the conversation, so if something does happen your family members or friends or whoever you've appointed understands the responsibility that they may have. Yep, I agree. And I like the idea of setting funds aside because if you think in Michelle's uh, example, I do know this dog, wonderful dog, but would need ongoing training, ongoing support, you know, and that's costly. So, you know, right. keeping that in mind and thinking about what your dog's needs might be after you're gone and making sure that that's not a burden, you know, as we discussed on that person. So Michelle actually does have a question uh, too. So she says, I have a trust and was specific about who to contact about all dogs. Do I need a specific separate POA? You do not. So generally a trust covers it. Um, there are some people who recommend getting both. I find that it's unnecessary. A trust generally covers all of that. And as long as you, whoever you name as trustee, is trustworthy which is kind of implied in the name um they'll follow through and give all that information and my only recommendation is that for example like with vets and things like that making sure that that information is kept with your trust documents so whoever needs to access them right away to know who to call 
also has that information that they can pass on immediately. So just having everything in place. But I don't think necessarily a power of attorney is needed when a trust is already there to cover it. Okay. And she just has one last comment. She says, I reached out and made sure the people I specified for Brutus would help before having the docs drying up. That's perfect, Michelle. Yeah, I figured knowing you, you would be, you'd have the I's crossed and the T or the I's dotted and the T's crossed. So <laughs> yeah, <Michelle laughs> that's great. She's, she's on the right path. <laughs> that's <Yep>. right. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All, all right. right. So that's all we have for comments right now. Perfect. So jumping back into our slides. Um, so New Hampshire statute actually does include a provision specifically for creating trust for um, pets. So it does authorize that the trust can be created to make sure that animals are cared for during the grantor's lifetime and then once the grantor passes away. So powers of attorney for pets. Um, Again, like I, I just mentioned, they're not necessary when you have a trust in place. The only time that this really comes into play is if you opt for your personal estate plan to go with a will instead of a trust, which some people do just because, I mean, a trust tends to be more expensive, a little more involved. Some people aren't comfortable going that route. So a power of attorney is an alternate to making sure that your pet's protected without going through the trust process. So, and like I mentioned before, a power of attorney for pets functions similar to a power of, or a durable power of attorney in which you're giving information for who your pet care provider will be. Um, you usually list out who your vets are for your pets and any other kind of specific pet care instructions that would be applicable for your pet to make sure that your caregiver knows what to do. Can we just go over this? Uh, uh, are oh. we able to go back aside? Yeah, that fourth bullet I point. So. I wanted to see if we could expand upon that. Nope. Uh, I'm sorry. So I'm going to minimize <laughs> it. I'm so bad with computers. <laughs> All right. No problem. Gonna, there we go. And present again. Sorry about that. A little no, too No here. problem. Uh, yeah. So the pet power of attorney is particularly helpful if you are traveling for extended periods of time to ensure that your pet is cared for properly during your absence or provided directions in case of an emergency. So one of the businesses I used to own was a um, pet sitting dog walking company. And regularly we would have people away for extended periods of time, maybe even overseas. But no one that I knew of had this or they didn't share it with us. And I think you know, cor uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I think now if I still had that business, I think one of the conversations I would have with our clients who are traveling is a power of attorney and knowing if something were to happen to them, because I know, you know, I, I belong to pet sitting groups online and there's uh, instances where this has happened. Um, you know, ha knowing that information um or having uh, you know some kind of conversation with these people if something were to happen to them so that you could act on their behalf to put things in motion i guess is that a, a conversation you think that would make sense for that people in that industry to have absolutely anyone who, who's taking care of a pet for a duration of time in which the other person the owner might not be accessible immediately or something could happen to the owner um th this is kind of essential it, it really gives a direction and authority for the whoever is taking care of the pet in the person or the owner's stead can really step in and act on their behalf to make sure that the pet's take care for during this time well, and I know when COVID first reared its ugly head as well, we had a lot of our clients reach out to us with concern that if they were to pass, what would happen to their pets? And, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, because we didn't have you guys as a resource back then, but, uh, um, you know, I, I have a feeling that that's probably still a concern in some people's minds. Um, can you talk a little bit about what service um, you know you might offer? How you work with people in regards to you know having that fear that they might pass due to COVID, um, and you know here their pets are without what comes next. And actually, let me flash this up from Leslie because I think she um, she words it well too. So you've done up your state documents, and I think a lot of people have done that since COVID mm -hmm. started. But if they forgot to add their pooch. Should they like run right back to their lawyer right now and do that? Is that the next best step? Uh, yes. Um, unfortunately, if, if you left out your pet in your trust um, or, or your other estate planning documents, they're not included. So they're going to be treated like tangible property. 
Um, so if you do want to make very specific provisions for your pet to make sure that they're going to a certain person, make sure that they're cared for the way you want them to. And again, hitting that stipend that we've mentioned a couple times, making sure that that's in place, you definitely need to have a conversation with your attorney about updating your documents. The nice thing, though, is that updating your documents, aside from an additional fee, is a relatively quick and painless process. So it is something that's easy to do. Um, it's just, unfortunately, a little bit extra cost to update them usually. Yeah, Leslie, I'm glad you asked that because that was the problem I had because I didn't even think about it. I just assumed that anything we owned when we made up our will would automatically go to our beneficiary, but it wasn't with pets. I had to name our pets. I had to include them. So we ended up having to go back and add them. And as Megan said, it was painless, but it was expensive. Right. Um, so if you can do it ahead of time when you uh, set up your will. But now maybe, Megan, can you explain that to me? Because I guess I'm confused. If pets are property and you are assigning your property, your house, your assets, things like that to your beneficiary, why aren't pets automatically included there? So pet, pets are a little weird because they, they're living property and they're, depending on the type of pet, there there's certain regulations behind it. So if it is a farm animal, um, there are certain regulations about how they transfer and they're treated a little different, even though they are technically property. So they have to go through a probate process. With dogs and cats, usually it just passes on to the beneficiary and that process is part of, or they're considered part of a tangible property. So it just moves on. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So I hope that kind of answers that. <laughs> yeah, so basically, Leslie, go out and get it done. <laughs> Thanks for your question yes. though, that was important. <laughs> All right, um, any other questions about the, the power of attorney before I move on? Uh, no, the other ones I was gonna save towards the end. Okay, perfect, so I'll move on to talking about the pet trust. Um, so a pet trust functions similar to a pet power of attorney. It's just a little bit more involved. So generally when we create trust, we are moving all assets into a trust. So it's no longer in your name and it's held in the trust to avoid probate. And the person who's in charge, usually the way we create trust is that the grantor, who is the person creating the trust, creates the trust. And then they're usually listed as the trustees or the people who administer the trust until they pass away. And at that point, then we have successor trustees step in and administer the trust. What we can do with pet trust is we include a provision that specifies any pets. Um, like I said, I either approach it by naming each pet individually and then including a provision for any future pets, or I can just leave a bit general and just say any pets that are currently owned or um, that will be owned in the future. So this way we're making sure that we're creating a catch-all to catch every single pet, no matter what, there's no specifics. Um, and with that too, when we create those provisions, we make sure one that we're listing who that pet is going to. If you want to create any kind of funds to take care of the pet, we can add a provision there saying how much money you think is appropriate and making sure that that money is either distributed annually for the pet's care during the duration of the pet's life or, um, or we can do a lump sum stipend, whatever makes the most sense based on your own assets and your pet's needs. On top of that, we can include specific provisions that regard how the pet is taken care of. For example, I once had a client whose pet had a very strict diet of having a fancy salmon. The dog ate better than I did, um, but he had a salmon every single night. And as a result, the, the owner wanted to make sure that that treatment was maintained. So we included it actually in the trust as a provision that the pet would be fed that certain specific diet um, throughout the duration of the pet's life. And on top of that, whoever was going to be the caregiver for the pet um, was actually going to move into the house so that the pet didn't have to be relocated. So that's kind of the extremes, but there, those are all provisions that we can include in trust where the pet's living. If it is the pet staying at the home, who's moving into the home to, for the duration of the pet's life, and then making sure that the pet is cared for in the way you would have wanted them cared for. And Megan, does that catch-all clause, does that include current pets and future pets? Yes. Okay. So I always make sure that I write it in a way that includes both current and future. Okay, so if good. anything changes, again, I want to avoid with my clients them coming in every time something changes in their life. Right. Um, so the goal is to have as minimal changes as possible because every time we do need to make a substantive change like that, it is more money. So including provisions that say something generally, um, make sure that we catch them all. However, if there are specific needs for any of those particular pets that are different than what we have in the trust, you may want to update it for that purpose to make sure those extra needs are included or just making sure that your caregiver is aware of that so that whoever is taking charge knows the differences, even if it's not written out in the trust. Okay, great. All right.
And I believe that's the end of our presentation, so. All right, well, we've got some great questions here for you. So let me just flip that out. Okay, so let's see. Aaron says, a lot of rescues have a clause in the contract that the dog must be surrendered back to the rescue upon the death of an owner. How does that work when the trust names who I want my dog to go to? That is a fantastic question. So in those scenarios, what we'll do is um, notify your attorney that that's the scenario that's going on. And most likely the attorney will reach out to the pet rescue to have a conversation and see if they can work around that clause by having a beneficiary who can inherit that dog or, or other pet. And I, I would think that a reasonable rescue would be okay. If you're carving out specific provisions for the care of the dog, that's, I, I would, that I would believe that they would agree to that. I, yeah, I would too. But it, that's good though, to think that um, the rescue would be contacted and be part of that discussion. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for that, Aaron. Uh, Christine asks, is a power of attorney necessary if you are away for a few days and your pet is with a neighbor or friend? Not necessarily. Um, it is just like a precaution if you want to set one up. But generally, when you're that we're gone for that short of a time, um, your your per the person who's taking care of your pet during your time away probably knows how to get in touch with you, and you'll be back soon enough that if there was an emergency situation, you'll probably return within the resolution of that um, scenario. So, for example, taking your pet to the vet or something like that. So, it's not necessary. Okay. Uh, Leslie says, so I can't just write up a letter stating my wishes about who will care for him with the understanding that they would be willing to foot the cost. So you can do that. The issue is that it's not kind of legally binding. The issue is if somebody contests that in any kind of regard, um, or if a court order issues who is supposed to be getting the dog, your letter writing how your wishes are for the care of that pet are going to be overlooked. So well, especially the, if the person you've named in your letter passes before you do. Right, exactly. And then or you if that, put them in your will. Right. Or if that person isn't blood related, they might not have standing to argue for the care of that pet. Yeah. So, Leslie, that's a great question because you think it could be that simple, especially if you have, you know, your brother or your, you know, your your child or something like that. But anything could happen that could, you know, make that not happen, unfortunately. So it is definitely better to make it legal and binding. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michelle says, Ooh, I don't know if we mentioned future pets in the will. So what happens if a lawyer did not include that as part of a catch all? So if, if that's the case, um, they didn't include a catch all, um, and there is a new pet technically it could go to the cart, uh, sorry, the court, I am tripping over my words today. Um, and it might have to be probated in the way that is outside of what your expectations are in the will. Most likely though, um, if, if it is for like a will um, or a trust, even if future pets aren't included, they'll read in the language that it's expected that any future pet probably would be treated the same, but it's always good to try and shore up those holes. So if future pets aren't listed, maybe next time you're reviewing your documents and have any changes, make sure that that's updated. So I'm wondering how many people are watching us who are going to run over to look at their will after this conversation and, and go through these details. I highly recommend you do that because if you're like us guys, you probably did your will when you got married or when your first child was born. And you know, that was decades ago and you have no idea what was written in there. So definitely go take a look and, uh, you know, see if, if you're covered there with your pets. And uh, Leslie was saying those are all good points. So, yeah, yeah, I agree, Leslie. So, so Brittany and Megan, if people want to talk with you further, what's the best way for them to contact you? Um, I'm a big phone person. So anybody has questions, feel free to pick up the phone and give me a call. I can't guarantee I'll be at my desk, but I will get back to you. Um, and email is great, too. Um, if, you know, if it's a quick, easy question, I think Megan and I would both agree that a quick email is certainly fine. Um, but if there's more in-depth conversation or discussions that people want to have with us, certainly, um, our phone number is on our website. Um, I was going to say, can I put it in the chat box or however you want to do that? But our website has all of our contact information. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And, and I think that I see properly on your website that you offer a free consultation. Does that does that re um, relate to this? 
Yes. So I mean, I think it can relate to everything. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> so, but for for estate planning yeah, sure. in particular, the way we handle it is um, if if it is just a consult to see if an estate plan is what you need, um, we we offer that consult, and we only charge for filling out the actual documents, and then we handle it on a flat free basis, which we'll discuss in during the course of that initial consult meeting. Okay, great. And you know, guys, I, I do, I highly encourage you to go look at your wills after this conversation or within the next couple of days. And I mean, this has really been eye opening. This has been fantastic information. And you know, if people have a lot of questions after this, do you guys, would you be willing to come back for another future conversation? Absolutely. We'll get a little more educated after looking at their will and stuff. Yep, absolutely. Okay. No, this has been an absolute pleasure. And I'm more than happy to talk again. Yeah. Well, Michelle says, thank you so much for this. This is so important. Yes, Michelle, tell people that this needs to be done. Tell everybody to look at their wills and make sure. Um, so uh, if there's no more questions, and we're going to be on for just another couple minutes, guys. So if you have any more questions or comments, let us know. But um, we did have some people ask some questions. So I want to make sure that we award that uh, gift certificate that you guys so generously offered uh, to Hot Knot. Uh, let's see. Michelle did have one more comment. She says, I highly recommend reviewing your will every three to five years. I mean, you really should, Michelle. It's amazing how much time goes by um, and people don't look at it. I honestly, I don't think I've looked at mine for over a decade. Um, but with everything that happened with COVID, it's I think it's important to, to have checks and balances. Uh, we have yes. Jamie chiming in here. She says, I apologize if this has been addressed. Can you leave money that would be used to care for your pet by the person that takes them in? Yes. The answer is yep. yes. And that is yeah, one of the that, primary purposes really for doing these things is so you can allow for specific items such as finances um, for the care. Well, and I love the example that Megan gave in regards to the salmon every night. And I was thinking in my head, as you said that, you know, salmon on a crystal dish at a fancy table with fine china. And I'm like, you know, all this stuff that people, these rituals that uh, people have for their pets that kind of need to be spelled out in the in the wills, if that's the care, you know, that you want for your pet um, yeah. after you're gone. So, I mean, I personally like the moving in to the house house where the travel um you know we we tend to have somebody stay at our house if they can to watch my dog because she doesn't like to leave where she's comfortable her house our house so i think that's a great one too it's important you know so anyway and if you have the ability to provide that care um it's important to do so i agree I think and i'm just Megan gonna flash this frozen. up again i don't know if that's just yeah i think end, megan is frozen <laughs> At least she wasn't making a funny face when she froze. <laughs> we'll tell you what, yeah, everyone, no. we award the, the gift certificate and I, we don't sure. have any other comments at the moment. So what I'm going to do is just share my screen. I'm going to go to the wheel of names that I know our audience is familiar with. So we had five people ask questions and I have you guys all in here. I'm just going to shuffle you up. All right. And so we're just going to pick for the winner of the $25 gift certificate gift certificate to hot knot in manchester and yes, that and if nobody has to... been there they have craft beer and pretzels and it looks like aaron is gonna enjoy yep, some aaron's gonna be our winner it's a great little spot it's right on elm street in manchester so i believe um megan has the gift card and so tracy if you would be kind enough um to get information from aaron we'll get that out in the mail to her yeah, I'll connect you guys via uh, email and then she can give you her address and uh, awesome. have it sent out. So congratulations, Erin. Thank you, everybody, yes. for your questions and your comments. That was fabulous. Thank you so much, Brittany and Megan, for your time and all Thank your you. fabulous information and resources. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. So you Thank have... you so much for having us. Absolutely. So everybody have a great night and thank you again. We will see you at the next pop-up talk.